Get Gutsy episode number 94 with Arabelle Yi on releasing anxiety and rejection to find your true purpose. Welcome to Get Gutsy. I'm your host, Jenny Fennig, and I am so excited to be on this journey with you. A cutting edge show blending business and spirituality, Get Gutsy serves up a potent blend of stories, lessons, and tips to help you make a massive impact in the world through your soul's work and your inspired life. No more going it alone, no more excuses. The world needs more brave women saying yes to leadership. Are you with me? Good. Let's get gutsy now. Hey, y'all. Jenny here. Super pumped to serve up another episode. Welcome to November. OMG. Two months left of 2016. Wah! It's exciting. Uh, And just heads up, like if, if your year or your life right now is not exactly the way you thought it was going to be, join the club. I am totally basking in this uh, energy of, you know, we plan and God laughs. Uh, It's great to plan. It's great to have a vision. It's great to say, here's what I want. And often (laughs) what is in our highest and best good is not exactly what was in that plan. So much of our plan is guided by ego. And I have found that many times my plans just like crumble. And my vision can still be there. You know, it's often that my vision and plan aren't totally the same thing. Like the vision is the vision. It's this grand energy that pulls me forward. And then the plan is one path that could help me achieve that vision, you see. And so if you are in a place where your plan has like crumbled or, oh my gosh, this isn't exactly what I thought was going to be happening, is happening, um, just breathe through it and trust that the highest and best good for all parties is occurring. And that's really what I come back to. I aim not to attach to a particular outcome because that is when suffering occurs. I aim for the highest and best good for all parties. Okay. So you're going to love our episode today. I'm going to tell you about it in a second. But before I do, I want to make sure I am giving you an invite to something happening this month. Okay. It's happening in New York City. I'm going to be in New York. Um, receiving my my honor as coach of the year um, from the Stevie Awards for Women in Business. It's a very prestigious honor. I'm pretty, I'm more than pretty excited. I am thrilled. I am just so, so thrilled to be in this place. And uh, I'm going to be there with my team. And it looks like my mother is going to be joining too at the dinner, which is fun. <laughs> Adds another element of, of you know, energy and excitement to the mix. It's kind of like the the Oscars or Emmys of like the female entrepreneurship space. They're called the Stevie Awards. And uh, we're, we are a finalist for Coach of the Year and I will find out very soon whether we win the gold, silver, or bronze. And while my vision is the gold, I know that the highest and best good for all parties will actually occur, but definitely shooting for that gold. Uh, and to just make use of my time being in New York, I said, hey, let's let's gather the crew together. I want to have an event called True Calling. It's a gutsy gathering for new and aspiring coaches. And, you know, if you're more if you're more of an advanced coach, we'd love to have you there, too, because I, I would just love to meet you. And it's a great um, deal for what we're offering up in terms of price. And it's going to be awesome. It's on a Saturday. It's Saturday, November 19th. You know, there's mingling that begins at 2 p.m. Um, the workshop goes for two hours from 2.30 to 4.30, and then we'll have some what I call afterglow and pictures, 4.30 to 5, like dancing, hugs, celebrating being in New York, that whole thing. We have a great space um, in the West 20s of New York City, and I just want to meet you. I want to meet you. I want to hang out. Um, I want to teach you some things. I want to just you know, just feel the energy in the room. We're going to have a lot of visionary leaders there, expansive thinking, and it's space to claim your big vision for 2017 and beyond, okay? And you're going to get hooked up with a um, with a DVD, uh, a vision board magic DVD, while supplies last. I, I We have like a certain number of those, and want to make sure that, you know, I, I think everybody who's coming can get one, but it'll definitely go to the first the first number of, of peeps who sign up and, and grab, your, grab your ticket to 
this event. So you can go to jennyfennig.com slash true NYC. That's jennyfennig.com slash true NYC. Grab your ticket there. And we're also going to be doing, um, I just said, you know what, let's just have fun with it. And we're going to do, um, you know, buy one ticket, get one free. And so get one for you and then give one to a friend or, you know, split the cost between the two of you. Y'all will figure that out. But buy one, get one. And the tickets are only $97. Okay. Like we're just hooking you up. Um, I'm going to be speaking as well as Elaine Wellman, who is on my team. She's the assistant director of Get Gutsy Coach Training School, which is our amazing, uh, just coach training experience for light worker leaders, you know, spiritual coaches committed to making a difference and a great living. And we're just, we're going to just rock, rock the house and have a blast together. So jennyfennig.com slash true NYC. The last time I held an event in New York, it was just a several weeks back. Um, one of my clients from California flew in. I had one of my clients from Pennsylvania, like drove in just for the event and then like drove back a few hours home that same night. She had a birthday party for her daughter the next day. Um, I had a client, former client from who now lives in Boston. She came in for it. So don't let the fact that maybe you don't live in or around New York city deter you figure out a way to come get yourself there and trust that some magic is going to be occurring connections will be made uh good things will go down when you are in a room like this okay so jennyfennig.com slash true nyc i'm excited to see you there and definitely spread the word to your friends who are you know excited to walk this path of coaching who may not be doing it yet but they want that guidance i want to give that to them and if you're already doing it come too so we can you know meet you and and celebrate going to another level and you know with the rest of the time we have in 26 2016 and then where we're going in 2017 all right, so listen, the episode that we've got for you, it's a gal named Arabelle Yee. She is, oh my gosh, her story is spectacular. She's so strong. She's just done a lot. Uh, she was originally from Burma, and just the way that she got out of that country and pursued her dream of, you know, being educated and just having a different kind of life for herself. She's lived in, you know, several countries, and she has a very, very powerful message, which you are going to learn about on this episode of Get Gutsy. So without further ado, I introduce you to this episode on releasing anxiety and rejection to find your true purpose with Arabelle Yi. Enjoy it. Hey, 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 everybody. Jenny Fennig here welcoming you to another fantastic episode of Get Gutsy. I am super pumped to be with you today. And I just love being with you every time uh, because we just have so much ground to cover and the longer that I am in this podcasting game the longer I see uh, just how many people there are that are doing amazing things in the world and today we have an awesome woman she is from Australia and we are recording this it's like 11 o'clock her time p.m close to midnight and it's 11 a.m. my time. We are 12 hours difference as we're recording this. So we're already just giving Arabelle Yee tons of love for just staying up late for us so she can share her story on Get Gutsy. Let me give you her official introduction and then we're going to dive in. Arabelle Yee is the international speaker and Australia number one results and accountability coach. She has spoken on different stages internationally and worked with thousands of women from across the globe in the areas of self-development, mindset, human behavior, and business startup startups. A trained clinical psychotherapist and holographic NLP, that's neurolinguistic programming, practitioner, Arabelle is on a mission to bridge the gap between vision and reality for the next wave of female leaders, game changers, and thought leaders. So Arabelle, you are right at home here with the Get Gutsy crew. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for that introduction, and I'm really excited. Yes. How do you how do you get your stamina to stay up late and, and have conversations like this? <laughs> What's that? How do you get your stamina? Like, how do you kind of fight through <laughs> exhaustion? Because I know it's not always easy to stay up late. Uh, and so not just for being on the show right now, but how do you uh, how do you kind of navigate all the energy that's required to to work at a high level like you're working at? I have to say that. I have to repeat that cheesy line, but it's true though. Like when you do what you love, you you just get energy just from out of nowhere. Sure, there are days I get tired, but then I 
I just love what I do. And uh, there are so many days that I stayed up late until like 3 a.m. because I have an interview at like 1 a.m. in the morning. And I'm happy to do that as well. Mm -hmm. I love that. And it's true. When you figure out what you love to do, and for many of us, it takes a while. You know, we have to go through some misses to find the ones that oh, this is the hit, you know, this is absolutely what I'm supposed to do. Once you find that, it is so gratifying. And I know a lot of our listeners, Arabelle, are working on that. You know, they're finding their Mm -hmm. way to to, to doing the work that they love and creating a real business around it. Many of our listeners are already doing it and they want to move to their next level. So I'm looking forward to our conversation today and learning more about you. So did you live in Australia now? Is that where you grew up or was it some other spot? No, I'm actually originally from Burma, um, and I came out of Burma over a decade ago, and then I moved to Singapore, and I lived there for a couple of years, and then I moved to Australia. Mm, Yeah, I could tell. I was like, your accent is not straight up Australian, because I have a lot of Australian friends, but I was curious. You know, I thought maybe there's some different dialects. So (laughs) uh, Burma, Singapore to Australia. So what led you to Australia? Well, it was, um, I got married, so I moved here. But then I was also looking for something else in my life. So I moved around quite a bit. I moved around a few jobs because, as you know, you, you would have heard of this so many times from a lot of people that when you're look, looking for something, you start to change, try and change and try and move countries quite a few times to figure out what it is that you're looking for, um, only to find out that actually it's within me that all this time what I've been seeking. Mm-hmm. And what was that within you that you found? Um, I have to say the purpose, my purpose, why I'm here, um, what I'm here to do. And um, yeah, so it's uh, purpose. We'll, we'll dive into that. Yes, mm-hmm. we'll dive into that story in a bit, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We will get there. Curious, though, what was it like growing up in Burma? That's a country I've never been to. I don't know much about it. Mm-hmm. Do you know where Burma is? Uh, not really. <laughs> I know. Okay. Okay. Hold on. Okay. It's in, it's somewhere in Asia, the Asian region. Asia? Yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> is that the correct that's continent? That. Like Asia. Asia. Yeah. That's, mm-hmm. that's true. Kind of so near Burma Nepal. Is... is it near Nepal? Mm. So it's between India, China, um, and Thailand. Oh, okay. It's actually a big country, it but is. it's been closed out from the rest of the world yes. for decades that not many people know where it is. Okay. But mm -hmm. growing up in Burma was very different. It was, it was very unique, I would say. Um, Burma, it's changing now, but before it was very, um, because it was closed out from the rest of the world, it was very conservative, very cultural, Mm -hmm. and um, we were a tight knit community. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's where I grew up. Wow. And why was it closed off? That was a political piece, but what, what, why was it closed off to the rest of the world? That, that was definitely because of the political reasons. Um, we had a military uh, government before that ruled the country for about 60 years, if I'm not wrong. Mm-hmm. And because of that, um, there was a big thing uh, between uh, Burma and pretty much the whole world. Mm-hmm. So Burma against the whole world because of the, the, the government. Mm-hmm. And um, that actually... Um, made a lot of us go backward and Mm -hmm. while the whole world was going forward we were lagging behind Mm -hmm. and we really had to do a lot of catching up Mm -hmm. and so was that a big piece of you I mean when you decided to leave did you leave on your own did your family stay there what was your kind of inspiration for leaving and did you do that on your own Yeah, no, I did that on my own because I always had this drive in me, which I'm still trying to figure out where it comes from. (laughs) But I've always been very driven since I was young and I've always wanted to achieve something that's bigger than me. And I think partly also because while it was very unique to grow up in Burma, at the same time, I knew that there was more than what I knew back then. So because it was a very conservative and cultural country, there was this thing where, um, you know, as girls, when you grow up, you have to follow other people's step. You you know, you meet the right man who has status money. You marry the man so that you your life is secure. So there is this path that is, um, you know, 
almost defined for a lot of women, mm -hmm. and I dis I disagree with that. So. So the best way for me was to just get out of the country and um, and as you know, Asian parents, they can be like from the very conservative country, they can be very um, protective and they can mm -hmm. be very, uh, you know, yeah, very protective. And then my parents wouldn't let me let me uh, let me go. Wow. So I told them that I'm actually going to go study. And so that was like the best excuse I could find at the time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And then they finally let me go. So I moved to Singapore to do my master's. Um, however, that was um, just, just an excuse for me to get out of the country and for me to experience whatever it is out there. Mm. And um, I have to say, you know, all the exciting challenges started ever since then. And it hasn't stopped until today. <laughs> That's so awesome. Good for you. That was a gutsy move right there, just leaving Burma. I'm like, wow, what would it be like to live in a country that was closed off to the rest of the world? And then, you know, it was a very, uh, like you said, it was just, this is the way that it is. You you get married and you are under kind of your, your husband's thumb, if you will, and that's just the way that it is. And that did, you just knew, like, no, that doesn't work for me. I'm not going to do that. And so you had to figure out a way to get out. And, you know, studying was kind of, like you said, that excuse so your parents would, would let you leave. And now how do they feel about you not having come back to Burma, getting married to, I guess, an Australian man or uh, just living in Australia? Yeah. No, they're... Um, you know, I've come a long way in my life. I've gone through my own fair share of challenges. And also, um, I've had my own fair share of massive transformation in my own personal and spiritual life as well. Mm -hmm. So today, their outlook towards life, their outlook towards me has also changed. And I mean, my, I have to say my parents have come a long way as well. Mm, that's so good. I'm so glad to hear that. So how did, tell us more about your, your career path. So you leave Burma, you go to Singapore to get your master's. When did you start really diving into this work with women and getting into personal development and human behavior and um, psychotherapy and all those things that you're, that you're into now and you really base your business around? Yeah, so I've always been interested in, since young, since I was back in Burma, I've always been interested in psychology and human behavior. While everybody else around me was, you know, busy with um, just other things, like, I don't know, a lot of my friends were interested in makeup and, you know, nail art and stuff like that, and I would be at home reading all these psychology books mm -hmm. and being the weirdo among my friends. Um, and then when I moved, to, and then I was already working by, by the time I left Burma, and then in Singapore, I, although I did my master's, I was also, I have also started working already um, at, the, at that time. Mm -hmm. And so, as I mentioned before, you know, growing up, what I've been taught was in, for us, or for me, in order to be successful in life, that means um, that I have to have money, status, and um, you know, material possessions. That that is success. That's what I knew. That's what I was taught by the society and by a lot of people around me. And so I pretty much did everything um, that I thought I was supposed to do. And so, and when I started working in Singapore, I you know, I climbed up the ladder really fast and I started making the, um, the income that I never thought was possible. So to me, I, at the time, to me, I have made it, you know, I have arrived. <laughs> and, but what I found out was that although I was doing really, really well financially and in my career, I went through a series of accidents and um, in, a ten, in a span of 10 years time. Uh, and all of them where I kept ending up in the emergency ward and mm. I I always had this joke where I, I have the frequent flyer to the emergency ward mm. and and it, they were all major accidents hmm. so that that really at first it, they were just accidents to me I didn't really pay much attention but a lot of people around me were saying how come you're so unlucky how come these bad things are happening to you one one thing after another mm -hmm. um, I never really paid attention until the last one when I was finally diagnosed with severe anxiety disorder mm. and what was the last at, accident that one the severe like 
I was, um, I couldn't breathe. I didn't know what was happening. And then I thought I was choking or my heart, I thought I was having heart attack. I collapsed and then there were tears coming down my cheeks and I was like, I'm not crying. Why are there tears on my face? Mm -hmm. But then I couldn't really talk. So it was just like all dramatic and chaotic. But then I ended up in the um, hospital and that's when the doctor diagnosed that I have um, severe anxiety disorder, which I didn't even know that I had. Mm. So, so yeah, so at that time, while I was lying on the hospital bed, while the doctors were busy running around, running tests, the doctor came back to me and he said, all the tests are negative. And I said, okay, cool, so does that mean, so what was that, like what happened? And he said, um, are you an anxious person? And I said, no. And he said, are you stressed out? And I said, no. And he said, well, i sorry to break these news for you, but then, but you, I think you have severe anxiety disorder. And I said, that's impossible. <laughs> <laughs> and so the doctor said, to cut the story short, that I was to be on a medication. Mm. So I went home and that was the moment of realization that firstly, I've been having all those anxiety symptoms. By that time, I, I knew what were the anxiety symptoms because the doctor explained to me and I started reading up about it. But I've, I've been having those symptoms and reactions um, for quite a long time. In fact, for a few years already. Mm -hmm. But I never knew and I realized that the first aha moment for me was I didn't know because I wasn't aware. I didn't have the self-awareness. Mm -hmm. And the second thing was for me, was if, I, if I'm doing like really, if I'm successful, which I thought I was, mm -hmm. sure, like I was making the money and I had the title, which was very important for me at the time. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, how come I'm having all these you know, problems? Or why am I even anxious about things? And that was the moment when I started asking the right questions and no longer about how much more money can I make? or which position should I get next? Mm -hmm. But then instead I, I, start, I started asking, what is my purpose? You know, what am I doing here? What do I need to do in order for me to live my life with meaning and purpose and feeling fulfilled about things that I'm doing? Mm -hmm. And that's when everything changed. Mm. Wow, that is so beautiful. And as you're telling that story, I'm finding so much of my own story and your story the choking piece Arabelle mm -hmm. I used to have this choking thing like I was I was convinced that I had a smaller than normal esophagus like I told my husband mm -hmm. this I'm like I have a smaller than normal esophagus because I would have these these choking episodes where I thought I was choking mm -hmm. right like I would because I like you I had a I had a corporate background and I was moving up the ladder and I was super you know pressure filled environment and I thought this is my dream and I'm going to do it and I'm going to be like the head of the company and all these things and and I literally would be sitting at my desk like shoveling lunch into my mouth because you would mm -hmm. just eat as fast as you could because you just had so much to do and I had many episodes where I felt like I was like literally choking. And it was just, now that you say it, it's like I was never di diagnosed with severe anxiety disorder, but I realized that I probably had that, you know, um, yeah. because I never was really choking. It was just, I, as I look back now, and I, I, for me, I discovered yoga and I got really into mindfulness and I, I left that whole world and started just like you, like found my purpose and, and made a whole business around it. Um, but I was choking on a life that was not for me. You know, mm -hmm. I was choking on um, following the wrong path, essentially, and following what I thought people wanted of me. And for a time, I thought I wanted for myself because I didn't know there were other options. You know, I just thought, mm -hmm. well, this is it. This is what yes. one would do in my position. But I totally identify with that, especially with um, that. And it was a terrifying feeling. You know, when I look back at that time and I would try to explain it to my husband, he's like, you're not choking, your esophagus is fine. I'm like, no, you don't understand. <laughs> like it was, it was such a terrifying feeling. I would never want to go back to that point in time. And so, wow, lucky for you that you had that doctor who was able to just basically tell you what was up. And so you realize, okay, I'm going to start living life on purpose. Did you then immediately quit your job? Like, how did you handle that in a practical sense? 
Yeah. So the first thing that I did was, if this anxiety thing is in my head, then I must have created it, mm-hmm. right? Subconsciously. Now that I know, what can I start doing consciously so that I can start, you know, making, creating new patterns and new habits? And I, I started meditating. I started changing my diet. I started changing my lifestyle. Of course, it didn't happen overnight. And then it takes a bit of time as well for me to really get into that routine and mindset as well. Mm-hmm. However, it, it, it just it just took off really easily and I was into it because growing up in Burma, Burma is a Buddhist country, I have always been interested in, I I mean, I grew up meditating. So it wasn't something that's hard for me. So I went back straight into Vipassana meditation Mm. and I started seeing that I just got disconnected during those corporate years because I was after the wrong things and meditation wasn't really important, but I never really lost it. So, um, but the, the surprising thing was I never had to take medication because I, I knew that if it's in my head, I can fix it. Yeah. Powerful. So, the, yeah. And the, so that was the first thing that I did. I knew that I needed to take care of myself before I start figuring things out. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Smart. And, yeah. And your, 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 your background, like you said, growing up. Buddhist and having access to meditation, like knowing that that practice existed, that was such a gift for you. It is. Mm-hmm. It is. I mean, back then, I really hated my grandparents and parents for forcing it on sure. me, but now I'm thankful, you know? Oh my gosh, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so that was the first step for me to just take care of myself. But then after that, I started planning. Mm-hmm. So I asked myself, if I, I, I knew that I couldn't quit my job straight away because if I were to start doing something else, I needed to have that financial stability or at least some savings for, to, to last at least like six months. Mm-hmm. Um, so the first question that I asked was, what can I do for me to feel like I'm doing something meaningful? Mm-hmm. And I started asking and you know, looking back all my life, what did people come to me for? Like, what do, what do I talk about with friends? And I noticed that a lot of people, although I wasn't a guru, although I was just their friend, I knew, I noticed that many people used to, and you know, they come to me to tell me their deepest, darkest fears, they uh, their secrets, and they would ask me for their advice. Mm-hmm. And I realized that I get excited when I'm help help helping them and um, helping them solve their life problems. Mm -hmm. And I realized that, wow, okay, there is something in there. So what can I do about it? And and I started looking, I needed to scale up. That's something that I know. Mm -hmm. So I started looking at a few options and I realized that, okay, doing a psychotherapy training and becoming a clinical psychotherapist would be definitely the first step for me. Mm -hmm. So so to cut the story short, I was still working and then I started studying. Mm-hmm. And I really took my time so that I can still pay for the course and everything and I still have the income. And it was um, it was tiring, but when I finally finished um, my, my training and I when I became a psychotherapist, I knew that I was ready to quit my job because I already have some savings put aside as well. Mm-hmm. And so, so yeah, so I started my business. I've had two businesses before, so starting a business wasn't really new for me. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, and yeah, and I started working with people who have anxiety because that's what I went through, and I came out of the other side, and it just makes sense for me to help others who are um, struggling with the same problem. Mm-hmm. And then from then on, my business has evolved. I have evolved, and um, today I'm like working as a coach helping people with, you know, mindset, self-development, um, psychology, and um, business as well. Mm, I love that. How did you marry um, kind of those two do- modalities, therapy and coaching? I have, I actually, I have a coaching school now, which I love. I birthed that in 2015, early 2015. It's called Get Gutsy Coach Training School. And we have, we've had a few people come through and I, our next class is going to be starting soon. And I already, one of my good friends is a therapist and she's joining, she wants to become a coach and she's coming into mm-hmm. my school. We've had many other therapists come through because they've seen 
they want to bring in the coaching modality into the work that mm-hmm. they do with clients gives them just a different lens. Um, you often will attract different types of clients, different issues that you're working on. So how did you make that pivot and how does that uh, show up now within your business? Yeah, I I would say that there, there are three parts mm-hmm. to do that. And the first thing is um, I do know a lot of people around me as well who are therapists and they see themselves just as therapists. Mm-hmm. And the first thing is really ther- therapists can guide people from A to B or help them find solutions. Mm-hmm. And coaches do the same, same thing as well. Mm-hmm. But it's about... Okay, from the business side of view, it's about um, branding and positioning. Mm -hmm. But from the other side, coaching is also about um, being a leader, being able to lead other people. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I truly, truly believe that whether you're a therapist or a coach, Mm -hmm. I because you have this um, the spiritual aspect in your business and what you do as well. I'm sure you will resonate and relate to this also. Mm -hmm. That when we're working with people. I, and especially when you're working on mindset or there's, you know, some sort of therapy, Mm -hmm. I believe that it's extremely important for the coach or the therapist to work on ourselves as well so that one, we can lead our clients Mm -hmm. and two, we don't project our beliefs, systems and values onto them. Mm. And so in order for me to do that, I had to invest in my own self, uh, you know, ed- in, in my education as well. Mm-hmm. So I have mentors who, are, you know, world-renowned mentors. I have invested so much money in them because, one, I want to scale myself up. Two, because I, the more I learn and the more I do the inner work on myself as well as the education side of it, then I can synthesize what I learn and give it back to my clients. Mm. So it wasn't a difficult thing for me to marry up therapy and coaching because to me, I feel that they are very, um, they're very similar Mm -hmm. um, and pretty much the same, just how we do it is different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I, I, definitely feel you on that I feel like the piece that the therapist because I mean I I am such a fan of therapy like I my life I would not be talking to you today Arabelle if I had not gone through <laughs> therapy and I've had amazing therapists I have an amazing therapist now and we work on different things and I would work on with my business coach you know my business consultant there are times that I definitely bring up business in my therapy sessions without without question because there's just there's kind of deeper stuff that's going on you know it's like connected yeah. to like a wound or um, like a block, but I know for me, the therapy has been so powerful for healing, uh, peace, you know, healing wounds, you know, healing wounds from my past. And I most recently have been working with an EMDR therapist who, you know, specialty in, in the EMDR form of therapy. And that has just been really, really spectacular. And I've really taught, you know, taught my students, my coaching students that, yeah, definitely we can look at, you know, we can look at a lot of pieces of, of a client's life, but there are times when a therapist is absolutely the ideal uh, healer, you know, in that person's life, not that they can't be working with a coach, but there are times when we need to refer out to a therapist. Um, you know, if they're in a, a really like kind of a crisis mode, there's something going on that, you know, the coach just doesn't feel like they're the best, um, that they're the only support that can be useful for a client in that situation. But it's amazing that you're, that you can bring, you know, all those modalities to play for your for your clients so why don't you tell us more about how you've shaped your business you know we've kind of understood how you've gotten here what does your business look like now Arabelle like what are the revenue streams how are you showing up Um, what are you building yeah so from that um, from from starting the psychotherapy practice Mm -hmm. then people started coming to me because my business took off really fast within the first few months Mm -hmm. and um, because I knew exactly one I had the clarity of what I want 
what the kind of lifestyle that I want, right. how I want my business to look like, mm -hmm. and you know my target income. And so when it took off really fast in the first few months, people started asking to me, my peers, mm -hmm. they, they asked me for business advice. And so I started giving them business advices and to cut the story short, I have evolved my business to start doing like mindset piece and also the business side of things. Mm -hmm. And then, and then over the years, as I also do the work on myself more and more, I start to see this need for bringing in the transformational aspect of aspect as well as marrying the science and spirituality and helping people. And even if it's just about business, I know that there's always a part of us that we uh, that will be required to work on, even if it's just like self doubt mm -hmm. or. Um, fear and that is a big thing because that stops people halfway oh yeah and so 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 yeah so that's how I grew my business mm -hmm. and then um, my passion has always been all my life is public speaking I've done lots of public speaking and I thought you know what I should really start you know sharing my message and talking about it and speaking and teaching mm -hmm. and um, and I actually talked about it the other day to my clients that, you know, when I first started my business, I pitched 70, 57 places to hire me as a speaker. Nobody, some people say no, some people didn't even bother to say anything. So basically, I got rejected 57 times, um, but, I, but that didn't stop me. And... So I decided that, you know what, if nobody wants me, wants to have me in their events, I'm going to do my own events. Go so. girl. <laughs> <laughs> and how did you pitch yourself? Was that an email? Were you placing phone calls? What, were the, what did that pitch look like? Oh, emails, phone calls, everything. 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 And no yeah. one just like, no one took you up on your offer. Nobody knew how awesome you were. Okay. Like they don't know how awesome Arabella is. Did you ever see the movie Pretty Woman? Did you see that movie? I, I have, but I don't remember. <laughs> okay, like Julia, was it, um, what's her name, Julia Roberts? Julia Roberts, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and every time, like, I hear stories like that, because believe me, I've got plenty of those myself, too, and uh, she goes into the store, like, you know, she's a hooker, <laughs> she's like a prostitute, mm -hmm. for, and then she meets Richard Gere, and he kind of, whatever, and, and um, she first goes in the store when she's in, like, her hooker outfit. And they wouldn't mm -hmm. wait on her because they're like, okay, you can't afford anything in the store, like in Beverly Hills in California. Mm -hmm. And then she goes back in after she, another store had been really kind to her and like helped her and um, this fabulous like, you know, uh, guy at the other store like helped her and got her looking like professional and uh, and she goes back into that original store and they're like, can we help you? And she's like, um, you remember me? I was in here the other day. Yeah, you wouldn't wait on me. Uh-huh. Big mistake. <laughs> Big. Huge. Gotta go. More shopping to do. And she walks over there. <laughs> and so every time like something like that happens to me or I hear a story, it's like big mistake, huge, big. Okay, so they didn't know how awesome you were, but it was really it was like <laughs> this 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 great teaching moment for you to say, you know what? Fine, I'll just go do my own events. So yeah. <laughs> so you did so did what did you do for your first event? So, so I taught business and, you know, my first event, it was, you, I can't even call it an event because there were about five people, I think. And then from then on, I started doing more and more uh, workshops and, um, but this year I decided to take it, you know, make it big and I decided to travel to Asia and, um, um, you know, expand to other, other states in Australia as well. And so the first event that we did um, we were expecting about 50 people to show up and we had 400 people show up. Nice. Yeah. So, so you asked me about my revenue stream. So mainly what I'm doing right now is that I go around and speak because I absolutely love it. And people ask me, how can you talk the whole day, like from morning until night, no, without feeling tired and you're just full of energy. And I said, because I love it. And so so mainly that's how I make money. You know, I get to share my message. I get to help people. I get to see those trans see that transformation right before my eyes. Mm -hmm. And then of course I get to make money doing what I love as well, mm -hmm. but it didn't happen overnight. Right. You know, it went through a lot of hard work and a lot of rejections, mm -hmm. but, um, but then I'd work one-on-one -on -one with my one-on-one -on -one with my clients as well. Mm -hmm. So you're making money off the ticket sales, you know, from the events. And then are you making some kind of invitation, some kind of an offer yes. from the stage? Yes. Mm -hmm. So, 
So mainly it's um, it's the type of like a platform speaking where you would um, we would do some offer at the end for the right people and it's not for everyone as sure. well. And the right people will always come along. Yes, exactly. And is that like kind of a program with you, some sort of a mastermind, uh, you know, yes. a multi-month journey with you? Mm-hmm. Yes, it depends on, I used to have set programs and I didn't really like having set programs because I feel that everybody is on, you know, in different stages of their life and business. Mm -hmm. And so I, I'd like to put a high, you know, a very personalized touch to the way I work with my clients. So I personalize what we do depending on where they are at and what they require. Mm -hmm. So it can literally be just three sessions or um, I don't really do three sessions mm-hmm. though, but it can just be three months or six months or 12 months. Um, it dep- It really depends on what they need really. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, but that's great. Thank you for explaining that. And all of our listeners really take that in. If you are called to speak from a stage, you really love that. You, you get energy from putting your energy and your expertise out like Arabelle does. Then consider speaking. I have many women in my community. They help others like learn how to be better speakers. And I think that's it's such a smart strategy. Um, and if you love it, then it's just not even really a strategy. It's just like you love it. You know, it's your passion. <laughs> and so you're getting out there. And you do, like you said, your first event, five people. And it was it was very intimate. I'm sure those five people had an amazing experience. It was so intimate. They got, you know, up close and personal with you. And it just, it got you in the game. You know, like, okay, now we're going to do another one and another one and another one. For me, I got really into, um, like, retreats. That's my thing. Yeah. I'm very good at that. I can do, you know, multi-day and I take people on a journey. I bring a lot of my spiritual tools into the mix. We do a lot of meditation. I trained to become a yoga teacher when I got to the end of my corporate journey, when I was saying something's got to go, something's got to give because this isn't working anymore. And so I'm very thankful because I was not raised uh, in a Buddhist household. I was not raised with any form of meditation in my life until I found it on my own. And it Mm -hmm. really has changed my life. But I think it's so cool when you step out, you know, if it's a lot of our listeners are coaches because that's, you know, the lens I come from too. And we train a lot of coaches. You can bring all that into the work that you do with your clients. And if like with Arabelle, you know, being really great from the stage and being able to serve in that way, figure out how to make that happen. And if you aren't getting booked on stages, like she wasn't getting booked, you know, 57 rejections, as she said, go do your own freaking event, you know, just go do it, (laughs) go do it in your area, go do it in a town. You know, there's a lot of spaces out there, you know, uh, I'm not sure what exists where you are in Australia. I'm sure you have your own version, but I just found, cause we're, this will this will air after I will have already gone to New York. But in the month of October, I'm heading to New York. My business coach and consultant is having a retreat there, and I wanted to to host something for my community while I'm in town because I used to live in New York City, so I have you know I have a connection. And mm-hmm. I said, okay, we got to find a space, you know, because that's a piece. If you're going to do an event, you have to find the space to hold your event. And you know, a lot of hotels are very costly, and there's some that you can totally work things out with, and they're they're, um, you know, friendly to small businesses, if you will. There's certain biz- uh, certain hotels, especially in big cities, where a small business would have a very challenging time hosting an event there. It's just very cost prohibitive. But there's this website that I found called Breather, breather.com, mm-hmm. and they may exist in Australia. Maybe you have your own version where you can rent space by the hour. And they're really cool spots, you know, for a 400 person event, you have to find, you know, something big enough to hold you. But for our listeners, if you want to do like something small with 10 people, you know, a very intimate gathering, there are websites like breather.com where you can search with it the big city markets and go find a space that is really beautiful. You can rent it by the hour and you can then, you know, have your workshop and bring your people in. So thank you, Arabelle, for sharing that story. It's very inspiring to hear your journey, how you've gone from, you know, severe anxiety disorder into what you're doing now. I think that was really brilliant that you focused on uh, those with anxiety, you know, issues as you got your psychotherapy practice off the ground and then you're really able Mm -hmm. to evolve into coaching and now what you're, what you're doing and and tapping into your passion of getting on a stage and serving others. Are you now speaking on other people's stages? Have you pitched yourself again? Like what's going on with that now? Are you totally just, I'll just do it yourself. Like what's your (laughs) deal there? (laughs) Yeah. No, see, that's the funny thing because right now people invite me to come and speak at, on their stages. So 
it, it just it just take a lot of patience and hard work. So because people said no, that really pushed me to go out and do my own thing, do my own events, which meant that I needed to learn about event management and putting on big events. Mm -hmm. And now that I'm doing that, I don't even need to pitch other people anymore because they are <laughs> seeing that. And so they're now inviting me. So pretty much the whole year since January I've been traveling and I'm 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 home only for a couple of weeks and then I travel again and I just go around and speak and it would be until November um, so so it's um, it's yeah you love it love it I love it <laughs> mm -hmm. and is your husband does he travel with you sometimes like how do you make that work yeah so we split up last year um, because we decided that we are both going different directions in our life and it's better for us to go separate ways so that we're not holding each other back and so ever since last year it's pretty much over a year now and I that's another thing that I'm starting my life from scratch again and pretty much the whole year this year mm -hmm. while focusing on my spiritual growth as well as the business growth. Mm. It has been very challenging. It has been very exciting. It's the, the the personal growth that I have had over the last, what months are we in now? The last nine months mm -hmm. or more, it could possibly equate to, I don't even know, like 10 years of um, <laughs> learning. <laughs> Wow. Well said. Thank you for sharing that too. I know for, you know, for many that that is definitely what, what needs to happen. You've got to, you know, part ways with, with someone that sounds like you all, you know, handled it in, in such a mature manner of like, you know what, we're going to hold each other back and, and let's set each other free. What would you, I'd love to just tap into this, this final piece before I, I give you our, our final question and then tell people how they can find you online and all the stuff that you're doing. But, um, within the Buddhist practice, like what, what serves you now, um, to handle some of those things to handle you know what I'm, my husband and I are going to get a divorce to handle rejection and let's put myself out there and have events with 400 people like is there something within kind of your Buddhist upbringing or how you um, move through life as a spiritual human yeah. you know that, that I because <laughs> yeah. I'd love to learn from you and I'm yeah. sure our listeners would get a lot from your perspective as well there sure um, I'll try to keep it short but I have to say that um, I, although I was, um, I grew up as a Buddhist and I was born Buddhist, at one point in my life, I started to have a lot of questions. And to be honest, since about 13, 14, I started asking questions that a lot of people couldn't give me answers. Mm -hmm. And that was because if you, uh, you know, I'm not going to discuss about religion, but um, if you look at a lot of religions, there are aspects where the cultures and the traditions have made it it's actually not part of the original what was you know what was there mm -hmm. so there were a lot of things that didn't make sense to me at the time mm -hmm. and so at one point I decided that you know what I'm not a I'm not gonna be a Buddhist anymore I'm just gonna be uh, just a free thinker and I'm gonna go out and experience so I started spending time with um, you know people from basically all sorts of religions I started spending time with um, the hippies um, you know the, the spiritual hippies I started um, surrounding myself with spiritual leaders and um, the shamans mm -hmm. and so I get to see the world through their eyes and I start to understand that actually it doesn't really matter whether I'm a Buddhist or you know Christian or whoever it is the the core message of all things is pretty straightforward and pretty similar mm -hmm. and but out of all of those things I started to have this um, I started to resonate very deeply with the shamanic practices mm -hmm. and how they see through the eyes through the shamans mm -hmm. and so I decided to go to the source so I traveled all the way to South America into the Peruvian jungle on my own nice and and then I, um, yeah, and I spent time with the shamans and I learned from them. And so now my work is, um, you know, and my work as like my work on myself mm -hmm. is a combination of the Buddhism and shamanism and, um, you know, the free thinking and um, the, the science as well as the spirituality aspect of it. So it's all, it's an infusion, mm -hmm. but 
for me to be able to go through and handle all these challenges that I've gone through in my life, um, I doesn't matter whatever practice that I'm doing. Mm -hmm. the The only thing that's that matters the most is. Um, which I mentioned at the very start of this podcast, mm -hmm. the self awareness. Yeah. And so that self awareness is not difficult. It's just paying attention mm. every day, all the time, to as much as we can to the the thoughts that we have, the actions, the behaviors, the thing that the things that we see, the patterns that we have, the habits. Mm -hmm. um, and it, if we pay attention, and it, because I pay attention to myself. And because I practice that self-awareness on a daily basis, when there's something coming up in me, let's say like anger or um, sadness, or um, you know, when we, when my hu husband and I split up, of course, there's this big emotional turmoil that I had to go through as well. But before, because I wasn't aware. I would only know that something is happening in there when it has exploded. Right. Now I can see that coming up, and it doesn't get to that level anymore. Mm -hmm. Meaning I can just diffuse that emotional charge. Yes. Yes. So things don't escalate. So things don't get ugly. So that means that I don't get stressed out that much. I don't. I don't. I don't feel um, triggered that much. Mm -hmm. I don't. I can't remember the last time I got angry. Mm -hmm. um, and it's all just self-awareness mm. to me. Mm. Thank you. That was really beautiful and well said. And I too am into shamanism and um, just bringing in these tools. I have this this great um, kind of like energy movement tools that I'll bring into the work that I do. I worked with a, a shamanic healer a few years ago, we, this whole like women's workshop over a four month period called Venetia's Garden. And we connected with, you know, different spirit animals and the energies there. There's just such wisdom that's in this world, and I, I want all of our listeners to go out and, and tap it, you know? Go tap it, because when we <laughs> tap it, we, we tap our own, and we remember um, what we already know, and that that's really us stepping into higher levels of leadership. So, Arabelle, you're amazing. I'd love to know the answer to our final question. What's the gutsiest <laughs> move you've ever made, and how does it inspire your life and work today? Um. Yeah, that's a difficult question because I think I've made a lot of gutsy moves in my life, but I would have to say it, it's, it is traveling to the, the Peruvian jungle mm. because everybody told me how I will get robbed, how I will get possibly raped, mm. <laughs> and how all the bad things could go, you know, all the things could go wrong. But um, I just, and again, you know, growing up in an Asian family, you don't do, do these things. Like as a girl, you don't travel alone on your own. And so all these pressure from people around me saying, are you out of your mind to be doing this trip on your own? Mm -hmm. So to me, from where I come from, and like it was the gutsiest move, um, but I went there, I did it, and it has, it just told me that all these stories that we have in our mind of how things could go wrong, most of the time, they're just stories. Mm -hmm. And once I really break through that fear, and on the other side is a massive transformation. Absolutely. Oh my gosh. Well said. And you just made me like so excited because I've made a decision. I haven't, by the time this will come out, like maybe this will be my announcement to my people, but uh, <laughs> I, next year I'm turning 40 and you know, I'm very into yoga. And 10 years mm -hmm. ago I trained to become a yoga teacher and that was, that led to like a massive transformation for me because I left my six figure job without another job. You know, like I just, I got it. It's time to change. And mm -hmm. I have decided next year to go to India. And uh, that means me leaving. My, I have three kids and a husband. And I'm going to mm -hmm. be away from home for about two weeks time. But this trip just, I knew I would go. And I just didn't quite know how it was going to come together. Because how, you know, I actually, I don't like roughing it. Like I like to stay in nicer places. I like to see the world, but I, I prefer to be a bit comfortable while I'm doing it. So mm -hmm. it was just, I've heard India is very challenging and, but I wanted to go, I wanted to go deeper into my practice. And so the trip, the way it's just came is just 
perfect and miraculous. And I'm actually going with one of my friends that I've known since I was like 12 years old. We're both turning 40 next year. We're both wow. entrepreneurs. We both train to become yoga teachers. We don't teach yoga, but we live our yoga. I mean, I teach yoga. I just don't teach asana, you know. Uh, yeah. And so the trip is is fantastic. It's put on by an institution that I adore. I know the woman who's leading the, the entire excur- you know, the entire adventure because she spoke at one of my retreats a few years ago. So it was just the whole thing was like, of course, this is how I'm going to India. It's absolutely divinely inspired, and it's during my birthday month. So as you're sharing that story, I, I haven't really been completely public with it because I know the people who really get me will understand, but I know that some others may judge me. You know, how could I leave my family for two weeks? How could I leave? I have three young kids, and I just know that there's transformation waiting for me there, and it is, it's going to take me deeper into who I am as a human, and I'll be able to serve at a higher level as a Mm -hmm. spiritual business leader, as a teacher, as a guide. And I am so excited. (laughs) And so thank you for sharing your story of going to the Peruvian jungle. I'm very happy that you did that. I'm super pumped that I've gotten to know you and I look forward to staying in touch with you. And how can our listeners find out more about you and all the wonderful things that you are doing? Sure. Uh, they can go to my website, which is www.arabelleyee.com, or they can also go to my Facebook, which is Arabelle Yee. And um, I have a few freebies on my website, which they can download. And there's also a business book, um, which is called Little Business Book Inside a Guide to Starting a Business from Scratch. Mm-hmm. And um, for all the listeners who are starting a business, and if you need a step by step guide, that's a great way to start. That's a good place to start it. Um, and there are a few other freebies as well. Cool. So and they can get that straight from your from your main site, arabelleyee.com? Yes. Okay. Perfect. And thank you so much for um, having me here, Jenny. And I just wanted to add one thing to what you were saying about India. And, you know, as they say, you need to have your cup full first so that you can give it back to others. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yes. I received that. And that was the <laughs> message. It just kept coming to me that... Uh, it will allow. I know I'll be. I'll come back a better mother, um, a better wife, a better uh, coach, a better yogi, a, a human, like just a more developed human. You know, we don't know how long we have on this planet. My sister died when I was 16 years old, and she was 12, and so that was a pivotal moment in my life. And I, every day, I live with that truth. I don't know mm. when I'm going to go. And I want to see as much of the world as I can. I love it. You know, I'm taking a group, my mastermind, to Costa Rica for a retreat in January, which I've mm-hmm. never been to Costa Rica. What I hear, it's like a spiritual hub. You know, there's just amazing rainforests and, and land and, and energy. And and so that's really a quest that I'm on is to incorporate travel um, and adventure into, into my work because I just, I want to see as much of this planet as I can can because it just gives me so much fuel and it sounds like you're doing that too with putting on your events around the world let me know when you make it to the united states okay like when you come over here i'd love to meet you sure definitely i will do that okay excellent well everybody thanks so much for being here wasn't this amazing look at this woman from burma to australia uh anxiety disorder and what she's built in the world (laughs) it's so and no seriously it's like so inspiring when you think about your life you're like jeez you've done a lot. (laughs) You've done a lot. And so I know our listeners have been inspired today. So what is one move you're going to make today as a result of hearing this conversation? This is Jenny Fennig sending you so much love, light, and faith as you get gutsy. I will see you next time. Hey, this is John Lee Dumas of EO Fire, and you're listening to Get Gutsy with Jenny Fennig. Gutsy leaders unite and ignite. This episode of Get Gutsy was brought to you by Get Gutsy Coach Training School. This is the program teaching the future generation of coaches how to make a difference and a great living. So if you haven't figured it out by now, I have built my business around this calling of a coach. That is what my podcast is based on. My book is based on that. The courses and programs that I've developed over the years have really allowed this calling of me being a coach to get unleashed in the world in such a massive way. And I am able to be a confident coach because I went through coach training. I learned what it took to be strong and supportive for my clients and also how 
how to be a phenomenal entrepreneur, a smart marketer, and a savvy business owner. And I realized that there was a total gap in the market for those of you out there who want to train under uh, a successful coach, a successful entrepreneur, someone who walks her talk, is able to provide that gorgeous sacred container for you to claim your expertise and gifts, for you to package up the gorgeous value that you add to the world, and for you to be able to create a lifestyle that is beyond your wildest dreams, for you to be able to help as many people as you care to during this lifetime. And truly, being a coach is is just, it's completely epic, epic, epic. So we are in the throes of our enrollment period for Coach Training School. I invite you to check it out. It is going to be absolutely extraordinary. We'd love to serve you in Coach Training School. Come on over and check it out. It teaches you exactly what you need to know now to truly make it as a coach. And you will not find anything in the market quite like this or at such a huge value. Come check us out, coachtrainingschool.com. That's coachtrainingschool.com. Gutsy Coaches Unite.